Thank you very much, Dr. Antman, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning to present these results from the economic study for the Freedom Trial. As Dr. Fuster already presented, clinical results from the Freedom Trial showed that for patients with diabetes and multivessel coronary artery disease, cabbage, as compared with PCI using drug-eluting stents, was associated with significantly lower rates of death, MI, or stroke, with the benefit driven by significant reductions in both death and MI. This prospective economic evaluation was carried out alongside the Freedom Trial to provide additional insight into the relative value of cabbage versus PCI in the drug-eluting stent era from the perspective of the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, as um, Dr. Fuster already presented, there were 1,900 patients randomized in the Freedom Trial, 947 to cabbage, 953 to PCI. There were 36 patients in the cabbage arm and nine patients in the PCI arm who underwent no index procedure and withdrew from the study early on within the first week. Therefore, there were 911 patients who did undergo revascularization in the cabbage arm and 944 patients in the PCI arm, and these form the patients for our economic study. Uh, we uh, treated these patients according to the intention to treat principle, even though there were 18 crossovers to PCI in the cabbage group and five crossovers to cabbage in the PCI group. And median follow-up time was 47 months per, for both of these treatment groups. So the primary endpoint of our economic study was the incremental cost-effectiveness ratio expressed as cost per quality adjusted life year, or quality gained. And uh, costs and quality adjusted life years were discounted at 3% annually. Our approach to the analysis was a, a two-stage one, starting with an in-trial analysis based on observed survival, health state utility, and costs derived from reported healthcare resource use during the trial period. Following that, we carried out a lifetime analysis based on projections of survival, quality adjusted survival, and costs beyond the trial period. A little bit about our costing methods. This was a prospectively designed study with detailed resource utilization collected for the index procedures and throughout the follow-up period. Cath lab and cabbage-related procedure costs were based on measured resource utilization and current unit costs, and we applied a cost for drug-eluting stents of $1,500 per stent. Uh, even though this was an international study with patients enrolled from, from 18 different countries, we were careful to uh, apply costing methods that were not influenced by the length of stay, which can vary across different healthcare systems. And our cost analysis considered not only costs associated with the index procedure, but costs associated with all cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular rehospitalizations during follow-up, physician fees, outpatient cardiovascular care and medications, uh, cardiac rehabilitation, and nursing uh, home stays. Uh, this slide presents an overview of in index procedure resource use. Uh, these were complex patients. Uh, indeed, in the PC, patients randomized to PCI, about a third of them underwent staged procedures with two or, f or more procedures uh, in the cath lab that they underwent. There were 4.1 drug-eluting stents implanted on average per patient. Considering just the procedure costs alone, there was an incremental cost of roughly $3,000 for patients treated with PCI or, or uh, it, within the PCI arm. Um, while, there were, while the PCI costs associated with the PCI procedure were higher, over the course of that, the index hospitalization period, there were higher costs for the cabbage arm due to the, uh, the, the uh, prolonged recovery period and complication rates that uh, occurred in that arm. And the, the physician fees were also higher for cabbage. And what this rendered uh, in terms of a cost difference was a, a um, $8,600 increase in costs for patients uh, in the, the cabbage treatment arm. And that was highly significant. Um, over the course of the five-year follow-up period, however, there, was higher, there were higher rates of resource use in the uh, PCI arm 
largely due to repeat revascularization procedures, and these are shown here in terms of rates per 100 person years, and, and also rates of um, cardiovascular hospitalizations were higher for patients in the PCI arm, uh, and significantly so. Uh, there was no significant difference in the rates of non-cardiovascular hospitalizations. Uh, this slide shows um, annual costs as well as cumulative costs over the five-year uh, uh, period. Uh, the bars uh, with yellow representing cabbage and blue representing PCI show that uh, during year one, there was very little indeed difference between follow-up costs overall, um, um, slightly, favoring, slightly favoring PCI during year one, but from year two and forward, there were um, higher costs during follow-up in the PCI arm, and, and the incremental costs for the PCI arm tended to increase over time, such that uh, the cumulative costs, which started out uh, at the end of year one, uh, uh, roughly $7,900 higher for cabbage, they decreased over time such that at the end of five years, the, the cost differential was roughly $3,600 higher for cabbage at the end of five years. Um, Turning attention to the life years gained and the quality adjusted life years gained um, during the trial period, because of the increased uh, mortality rate for cabbage early on in the recovery period, life years gained um, were, did not become apparent until year four of the follow-up period, and at the end of five years, there were roughly 0.053 life years gained with cabbage. Considering quality adjusted life years gained because the recovery period after um, Cabbage is associated with lower quality of life. Um, indeed, the, the life years, the quality adjusted life years gained with cabbage did not emerge until year five. We uh, developed a Markov model to project the post trial life years, quality adjusted life years, and costs over the lifetime of the patient. And we did this by um, um, estimating the monthly risk of death based on age, sex, and race match data from life tables, US life tables that were calibrated to the observed five-year mortality during the trial for the PCI population. Uh, we estimated the cabbage effect based on a landmark analysis for using uh, data from years two through five in the trial where we obtained a mortality hazard ratio for cabbage versus PCI of 0 0.6. In our base case analysis, projecting forward in time, we assumed a gradual attenuation of that cabbage effect whereby the mortality hazard ratio increased from 0.6 to 1 in a linear fashion between years 5 and 10, with no impact of cabbage assumed beyond 10 years. And then we applied long-term estimates of costs and utility weights derived from regression models fit to our trial data. This graph here shows the in-trial survival period, um, experience through the first five years of the trial, and then our projections over the course of the lifetime. The area between these two curves represents the life years gained with cabbage. During the first five years, we have, as I mentioned before, 0 0.53 life years gained with cabbage, but over the course of the follow-up period, we get a, uh, an accumulation of life years gained um, largely due to that higher rate of death and the life years lost during, uh, due to the higher death rate in the PCI arm, um, such that at the end, over the taking a lifetime perspective, there were actually 1.266 total life years gained with cabbage. Now I'm going to present the results of our lifetime cost effectiveness analysis. We use this cost effectiveness plane to present results such as this where the x-axis represents the difference in quality adjusted life years and the y-axis represents the difference in long-term costs. So this red point in the upper right-hand quadrant corresponds to the, the incremental costs over the lifetime of cabbage of roughly $5,400 and the um, combined with the incremental gain in quality adjusted life years of 0.66 years. As a result, we get a cost effectiveness ratio of roughly $8,100 per quality adjusted life year gained with cabbage. Shown here is a bootstrap distribution around that estimate, and we see that 
near over 99 percent of this distribution lies be below and to the right of the line representing a $50,000 per quality adjusted life year gained, which is a benchmark for considering a treatment cost effective. And indeed, our estimate is, is very well below that. So, the, uh, so cabbage was, according to the, our uh, assumptions here, a highly cost effective therapy. We carried out several sensitivity analyses. Um, this one I'm going to present was our most conservative, where again, um, this shows the, uh, the observed survival for five years, and then the projected survival, assuming no cabbage benefit beyond the five-year period. Under this assumption, we gained, uh, we estimated 0.754 total life years gained with cabbage, and uh, an incremental cost-effectiveness ratio of roughly $27,000 per quality gained. And again, this is this even conservative estimate of the um, of the cabbage effect renders cabbage a uh, a highly cost-effective therapy. Uh, we also carried out subgroup analyses based on syntax score, and they all yielded cost-effectiveness ratios that were favorable even at the low syntax score. Uh, while the incremental cost of cabbage was quite a bit, uh, was tended to be higher, we got a, an estimated ICER or incremental cost effectiveness ratio of roughly $22,000 per life year gained. And for the other syntax score tertiles, the estimates were highly favorable. We carried out several other subgroup analyses, and for all of them, including stratifying patients according to sex, age, and US versus non US enrollment all of the results were highly favorable to cabbage. So in summary, uh, we found that cabbage is indeed associated with initial costs of roughly $9,000 per patient higher than PCI. These costs are partially offset by lower costs associated with repeat revascularization and to a lesser extent cardi cardiac medications. At five years, cabbage was shown to improve quality adjusted life expectancy by roughly 0.03 years while increasing total costs by $3,600 per patient. Uh, however, over a lifetime horizon, cabbage was associated with 0.66 quality adjusted life years gained and a roughly $5,400 per patient higher costs, yielding an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of roughly $8,100 per quality gained. Our results were robust to a broad range of sensitivity analyses regarding the duration of the cabbage effect on both survival and costs, and the results were also consistent across a wide range of subgroups. So in conclusion, for patients with diabetes and multivessel coronary artery disease, cabbage was found to provide not only better long-term clinical outcomes than PCI with drug-eluting stents, but these benefits are achieved at an overall cost that represents an attractive use of societal health care resources. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Magnuson. So we're going to first hear from Dr. David Williams from Boston on the clinical implications of what we've heard from seaport economics, tact quality of life, and freedom cost effectiveness. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, those of the three trials, uh, the leaders uh, who are here. Uh, these are extraordinary efforts. A lot of uh, work, for sure, has gone into these, and I'm sure they will broaden our understanding of how to take patients with, take care of patients with heart disease. Uh, my purpose is to uh, look at each of these three trials from the clinical's perspective. And then I'll offer some uh, questions uh, or commentary uh, uh, in, uh, in helping us understand them better. We heard uh, ab about Seaport. Uh, Seaport uh, is a, a clinical trial whose purpose was to compare the outcomes of elective PCI performed at hospitals with coronary bypass surgery compared to those without on-site coronary bypass surgery. There was a three-to-one randomization. Uh, to PCI at hospitals without bypass surgery, since this was the uh, group most interested in being studied. There were two primary endpoints, mortality at six weeks, and the incidence of major adverse cardiac events, which was a composite of, of death 
Q-wave MI and target vessel revascularization at nine months. These data have been published previously in the New England Journal of Medicine, but uh, from a clinical perspective need to be uh, revisited. The trial had a large number of patients, over, eight, over 18,000 patients. And in terms of the endpoints, uh, the six-week mortality rate was approximately 1% for both groups. They were not significantly different, regardless of whether the PCI was performed at the hospital with on-site surgery or without on-site surgery. The composite endpoint at nine months was also quite similar between the two groups, 12.1%, 11.2%, and these differences were not statistically different. What was different, however, was the rate of target vessel revascularization, which was actually higher in the hospitals without on-site and patients assigned to hospitals without on-site surgery. The authors concluded that PCI performed at hospitals without on-site surgery was non inferior to PCI performed at hospitals with on-site surgery with respect to mortality at six weeks and major adverse cardiac events at nine months. From a critical standpoint, this was an extremely well-organized and well-conducted trial. It was a very large study, and the findings, I believe, are quite valid. To be applicable, however, hospitals will need to replicate all the necessary operational and training activities inherent in the trial, which were really, really quite extensive. Uh, endpoints were limited to safety. We, we, uh, we did not investigate in this study any efficacy endpoints, so we really don't know did patients improve uh, from a clinical standpoint. This aspect of the trial remains to be answered. Uh, I do believe this trial is significant and will likely impact the manner in which PCI is performed in the United States. The performance of PCI at hospitals without on-site coronary bypass surgery, I believe, will be adopted and become the standard of care. The second trial we heard about today was TACT. The purpose of TACT was to determine the effects of chelation therapy on cardiovascular outcomes in patients with a history of myocardial infarction. The age of these patients was greater than the typical trial, uh, equal or greater than 50 years. And there was a random assignment to EDTA therapy or placebo. It was a two-by-two two factorial design where high-dose high vitamins were also compared to placebo. The composite endpoint, which is quite a composite, of all-cause death, recurrent MI, stroke, coronary re revascularization, or hospitalization for unstable angina, uh, was actually positive in the study. Of interest, the study was started in 2003 and took several years to complete. Uh, there were 1,700 patients in the study, uh, and the maximum follow-up was 55 months. Uh, most patients did not receive all the infusions as scheduled, and many withdrew from the study, were lost to follow-up, or discontinued the intervention. For the primary endpoint, as mentioned, there was benefit for that group, and the subset analysis demonstrated benefit for patients with diabetes and those with anterior wall MI. The investigators concluded that EDA therapy reduced cardiovascular events in these post-MI patients. In terms of commentary, uh, it's interesting uh, that a relatively large proportion of patients apparently did not receive complete study therapy. A, a substantial number of patients also dropped out of the trial, and their outcomes did not contribute, I don't believe, to the follow-up data provided. The primary endpoint was a composite of many different cardiovascular events, and the data uh, for the individual events was initially not provided. We saw this today, and they individually do not appear to be significant. There was no benefit for angina, as we heard from Dr. Mark. So although there were some aspects of the trial that suggested chelation may be beneficial, I felt there were too many questions remaining to be answered to recommend chelation therapy as standard at this time, and indeed, that is the conclusion of the investigators. The final trial we heard of was the FREEDOM trial. This was a large study to determine the, whether uh, primary piece, whether uh, percutaneous coronary re revascularization with drug-eluting stents is as effective as coronary artery bypass surgery for the treatment of multivessel coronary disease among patients with diabetes. So this is a unique subset of coronary patients, multivessel disease, and diabetes. There was random assignment of 1,900 patients uh, of either type 1 or type 2 diabetes with either two or three vessel disease, and the treatments were either PCI or bypass surgery. Patients had to have a legitimate indication for revascularization based on symptoms such as angina or objective evidence of ischemia, and the endpoints were all-cause all death 
MI in stroke at a minimum of two years. What the study showed is that the composite of rates of death, MI, and stroke were high and significantly higher among patients assigned to initial PCI compared to those assigned to bypass surgery. The individual rates of death and MI were highest in the PCI group, while stroke was more common among bypass patients. The rate of repeat revascularization was also higher among PCI patients. And the, importantly, these differences were seen in all subsets including those uh, ca classified by syntax scores. The authors concluded that bypass surgery was a, a significant benefit as compared to PCI, that there was no interaction between treatment effects of bypass according to any subgroup, including syntax score, and bypass surgery is a preferred method of revascularization for patients with diabetes and multivessel disease. So in a for the clinician to apply these data, it's important to note that the data apply, obviously, to the patients in the study, and that there are many patients who satisfy the eligibility criteria but apparently were not enrolled. It would be important to learn about who these patients are and what their outcomes were. For example, patients with low syntax scores may not have been well represented. We don't know that for sure. It's also well established that there are patients with multivessel disease for whom bypass surgery offers no apparent benefit in death or MI over PCI. Freedom was limited to patients with diabetes and multivessel disease, which likely is a different type of patient from those with multivessel disease that don't have diabetes. In this study, PCI, by treating discrete lesions, does not appear to be a suitable therapy for patients with advanced coronary disease and diabetes. We'd like to know more about patients with angina. That information was not shared with us at this time. Uh, and finally, patients with multivessel disease and diabetes represent a unique subset of the general population of patients with coronary disease. Their disease and their natural history differ greatly from coronary patients without diabetes. Presence of diabetes should strongly influence our decisions in managing patients with multivessel disease. Thank you.